This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Esther Gitui Ewitt is out tonight. It's Thursday, August the 1st. This is Africa 54. Rwanda wrestles with shutting down the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo over Ebola fears. A show of resilience in Nairobi as Hotel Dusa 2 reopens six months after an Al-Shabaab attack. And we'll take a closer look at child marriage in the United States. The Rwandan government has confirmed parts of its border with the Democratic Republic of Congo has been reopened. Kigali had briefly closed its doors of the city, the city of Goma in the DRC over the deadly Ebola virus. News comes after Congolese officials confirmed a third Ebola case in Goma. They say the one-year-old daughter of a man who died from the disease earlier this week has now also been infected. This is the first transmission of Ebola inside Goma. The city of at least one million people is a major transit hub. Shutting the borders complicates life for tens of thousands of people who travel between the two countries to earn a living. The World Health Organization is warning against trying to contain the virus by restricting travel or trade. Last week, it designated the outbreak a global health emergency, its highest level of alarm. The Dusit D2 Hotel in Nairobi reopened its doors this week, nearly seven months after a deadly terrorist attack that killed 21 people. On January 15th, Somali Al-Shabaab militants entered the high-end complex and opened fire. The attack echoed a deadly 2013 assault on a shopping mall in the same neighborhood. But as Sam Holder reports, the hotel is hoping to find a sense of normalcy again. This isn't just an ordinary hotel opening. It's a recovery from the horror of what happened here in January. 21 people were killed in an attack at the Dusit D2 hotel in Nairobi. Al-Shabaab militants using suicide bombs and guns to target guests and staff. The hotel is now welcoming visitors again, although with extra security. Life is back. Life is back. Business is back. The spirit and the strength of Kenyans is back. And nobody, no terrorist, nobody will kill the spirit of Kenyans and its visitors. Nairobi is a major hub for foreigners working in East Africa and has been targeted by the Somali militants before. Most notably, the Westgate Mall attack in 2013 that led to 71 people being killed and hundreds injured. Al-Shabaab say it's because Kenyan troops have helped the Somali government in their fight against the Islamist group. The Dusit D2 building was also used by a number of international businesses. The tourism and wildlife minister said that despite the attack, he's predicting a 10% growth in visitors and revenue for Kenya this year. And that there was Sam Holder of Reuters reporting. The son and heir of Al-Qaeda founder Osama bin Laden is presumed dead. According to reports from multiple U.S. officials, Hamza bin Laden was killed in a U.S.-supported operation. Speaking on condition of anonymity, officials say the young bin Laden was killed during the first two years of the Trump administration, but they did not say where or when the operation took place. It's also unclear what role the U.S. government played in it. U.S. news organizations report that the young bin Laden was killed before February 2019. The U.S. had offered a $1 million reward for information about his whereabouts. Hamza bin Laden was reportedly by his father's side when al-Qaeda launched the September 11 attacks in New York. Early marriage can happen anywhere, irrespective of race, culture or religion. Here in America, the state of Missouri set its minimum legal age for marriage at 16. 
Couples from neighboring states have long crossed into the Midwestern state to marry, often because the girl was pregnant and the baby's father feared prison for statutory rape. VOA reporters have spent much of the past year focusing on child marriage and how societies around the world value the worth of a girl. Well, today we bring you the story of an American girl, Kathleen, who lives in the state of Tennessee. Okay, uh, Kathleen Burns. I live in Dyersburg, Tennessee. I work all the time, take care of my baby and the husband, hang out with my buddies. That's about it. <laughs> Well, I, I met him about when I was like 13, 14. They lived next door to me and hung out with his family and his friends or his sisters. And I don't know, we just kind of started becoming friends and I got attached to him. I had a, probably a little crush, you know what I'm saying? And he couldn't ever keep a girlfriend because they didn't like me being around him. So one thing after another, after a few years, we just kind of ended up together. I got pregnant underage and that was kind of what had us go ahead and get married so I wouldn't send him to jail. A lot of people look down on him for it and stuff. That's kind of why he didn't want to do this at first, you know, but like I told him, I don't care what anybody thinks. <clears throat> I love him, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we, we're like any other marriage couple. We, we've had our problems. I mean, we split up. I went and stayed with them for a little bit, but we just know we want to live with each other. We want to be with each other, you know what I mean? So. We worked through our problems. I couldn't live without them. My mom was against it. She was like, you know, y'all shouldn't have done it. You can take your consequences for it. Me and my mom ended up having a lot of problems, you know. But she stuck by me through everything, so I love that woman to death. <laughs> Head cook uh, at Neil's Barbecue. I just kind of stuck around, you know, stayed unlike everybody else, and he just kept moving me up, giving me raises, so I stayed there. I did not uh, graduate after I had Xena. Got hard for to get a babysitter and stuff. Needed money. Candace got me the job. I just dropped out, and they kind of just let me slip through the cracks. I made it to 11th grade. I had one more year. and Should have finished it out, honestly. <laughs> I regret that every day. Eventually, I'll get my GED, but growing up life is really hard, <laughs> so, you know. Huh? Well, before I married, honestly, I was a kid, so there was really no bills. I don't really miss nothing about it, except just having to grow up and do the adult thing, man. That, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard, but other than that, I don't really miss nothing, you know. I'm fine with how everything turned out with me. Zena, my little girl, she is my pride and joy and I will do everything to take care of her and protect her, so. My mom always asked me if I would let her get with somebody older. No, I probably won't because, you know, we did have a lot of issues through our, I mean, it put me through a lot mentally and physically and mm -mm, I would not let my daughter do that. Probably marrying young, yeah, no, it'd be a no. Just because I know where I'm at right now from making them decisions. I don't know. I, I mean, I should have waited. I truly believe that. I should have waited, but things came up. I should have waited on having the baby, you know, because you really do need to be 18, in my opinion. You need to be grown up. You need to have your childhood. I lost all of my childhood. Hello. I do regret, you know, not finishing school, growing up way too fast. You know, that's just stuff you shouldn't do when you're a kid, honestly. I see that all now. I didn't see it then, though, so, and you can't change it. And Kathleen's story is from the VOA special report, Worth of a Girl. And you can learn more about these stories on our website at voanews.com. Stay with us tomorrow on Africa 54 when we look at child marriage in Nigeria. We're going to switch gears here a little bit. Now, she says life is full of opportunities and that we need to get rid of the mentality that we can be only one thing. Words of wisdom from a young Zimbabwean author and entrepreneur. Her name is Shietza Makwara. She's a Mandela Washington Fellow, among other things, and she's here with us in studio. Shietza, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi. So you're an entrepreneur, yes. an author, a motivational speaker. You obviously don't have a lot of spare time, but you've also co-founded a logistics company in Zimbabwe. Tell us what your company does and what the need is in your country for that line of work. 
As you may know, um, Zimbabwe mainly relies on imports for basic commodities. We're looking at rice, cooking oil, and uh, a lot of basic commodities, really. So our company is a logistics agent. So what we do is customs clearing freight um, shipping. And we've recently launched a, a, a courier service where it's overnight courier. So that's what we do. Are you trying to become the Amazon of Zimbabwe? I, I'm trying to become the FedEx or the DHL oh, the of, FedEx. All right. of Zimbabwe. Well, you know, amongst all these other things, you're also a Mandela Washington fellow. That's so, right. So for others who want to do the many things that you do, but who mo more importantly want to be a fellow, how does one become a Yali fellow, a Mandela Washington fellow? Thank you very much, Heidi. That's a good question. It's important for you to be consistent in your work, to show what you're doing uh, to everybody else because as you know it's such a rigorous process um, we hear that it's about 38 to 40,000 applicants so stay consistent obviously in the work you do but show it show it on social media engage um, in pre with, with previous fellows um, I think it's more about the exposure that's what they're looking at they're looking at is she or, or is he really doing the work? So, so show your best foot forward, yeah. You know, you've probably, obviously, in, in your line of work and all the things you do, you have probably experienced failure at some point in your life. What was a moment that was a real learning curve for you <laughs> where you've had to pick yourself up by the bootstraps oh. and get back on the road? You know, I'm going to talk about starting up and starting up a business. It's not easy. And you have to know that the money and the profits, they don't come straight at the beginning so you have to to be tenacious as a person you have to realize that uh, when you're building anything big in regards to your business um, it takes time it takes effort it takes uh, recognition as well so you're building your brand as you go you're 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 taking your time and what's more important is building that brand for you to get the recognition then you get the profits so it was a hard time for me at the beginning um, no clients I was absolutely new there were bigger players in the industry but your work speaks for you if you're excellent if you do things the the, the, the right way if you follow protocol and, and and you know what if you disrupt you know come up with a product that the, your other competitors don't have um, I think that's what I did to sort of get to where I am today and you, and you obviously travel to see how things are done in other parts of the world you've been here in the United States for quite some time now what in your view are the three most important things that you've learned mm -hmm. about leadership mm -hmm. and about opportunity mm -hmm. while you've been here teamwork is, is is important you don't work in a bubble you work with other people what I've learned about the United States is a lot of the places that I've been they're very inclusive and that's so important because in a team or in an organization you need different people with different ideas and that is very very important um, the same thing with the Ali just having 700 different people from different parts of the world just it really changed my my my, my, my world view and, and my mind space because all these ideas coming through I realized that my world was a little bit small there's so much more out there so and I, I, I suppose it's really good to be part of rebuilding your country back home and all the efforts to get Zimbabwe back to the prosperous nation that it once was. Absolutely. The, one of the, 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 the goals or maybe the objective of um, the YALI program is to learn best practices here in the United States and take them back home. So we're learning from the United States. They're learning from us. So obviously uh, I've learned so much and I am absolutely grateful and absolutely happy and it's been great. Well, we have feel, felt really honored to have you here. Zimbabwe is very lucky to have you. Thank you so do much. Thank you so much for your time. We wish you all the best with your future. Thank you so much, Heidi. That is Shiedza Makwara. She's an author, entrepreneur, and also the co-founder of a logistics company in Zimbabwe. Thank you so much for your time. She's a Washington Mandela Fellow. That is the um, YALI initiative. Um, she was here for the summit in Washington. Well, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please tell everyone to watch, share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. After the break, Democratic rivals take aim at former Vice President Joe Biden in a debate showdown in Detroit. That's coming up next.
begin. Bantu. Arabic. It is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct. And adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I am Shaka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. South African visual artist, Professor Zanella Muholi, is showing people around at the Stevenson Gallery in Johannesburg. Muholi's work has been exhibited here for over 10 years. She has been photographing lesbian, trans, and gender non-conforming African people for 13 years. She first began the Faces and Phases series in 2006 with the aim of creating a visual history of the underrepresented LGBTQ community. Since then, the provocative black and white portraits and stories of the people behind them have been displayed in New York, Amsterdam, London, Paris, and Canada. Muholi has also exhibited at global contemporary art events like Documenta 13 in 2012 and the 55th Venice Biennale in 2013. Next up, Olatunde Nafiu does not want to be late for class. The grounds of the Lagos State University are vast, and walking across them takes time. All Olatunde needs is his phone, the Awa bike app installed on it, and soon he will be on his way to his lecture on a bike unlocked via the app. Established in 2018, the Smart Bike Hiring Company is targeted at gated communities, estates, and institutions in Lagos who find commuting a challenge within their environment. Starting with five bicycles, the company now has scaled up to over 200 that are operating in seven housing estates and learning institutions. A 10-minute ride costs about six U.S. cents. The app offers navigation, and the bikes must be left at specific docking bays or a penalty will be charged to the user. And finally, if it cooks like a steak, smells like a steak, and tastes like a steak, it must be a steak. But one that is not from a cow's body, but is grown in the lab of an Israeli startup tapping into consumer concerns about health, environment, and animal welfare. While lab-grown hamburgers and chicken are in development worldwide, Israeli's Aleph Farms claims to be the first company to develop steak in a laboratory and is in talks with some high-end restaurants in the United States, Europe, and Asia to have it on the market by 2021. It plans initially to offer steak that is developed from a small number of cells taken from a cow without having to slaughter the cow in the process. A serving of minute steak, a thin slice of meat that cooks very fast, currently costs around $50, but Olive Farm says it hopes to bring that down to a slight premium to current prices of steak offered in restaurants. And that's what's trending today. I'm moving to U.S. politics now. Former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden was center stage at Wednesday's Democratic presidential debate in Detroit, Michigan. Biden found himself under attack several times by nine rivals on stage. But he was quick to counterpunch in what was largely a freewheeling debate. Biden made an impassioned plea that he was the Democrat best positioned to defeat President Donald Trump. VOA's national correspondent, Jim Malone, recaps night two in the second round of Democratic debates. It was a much feistier night of debate in Detroit, with the current frontrunner, Joe Biden, facing multiple attacks from his rivals on health care, immigration, climate change, and criminal justice.
But Biden also pushed back against his critics, including California Senator Kamala Harris, over their competing health care plans. And to be very blunt and to be very straightforward, you can't beat President Trump with double talk on this plan. So I think that you should really think about what you're saying, but be reflective and understand that the people of America want access to health care and do not want cost to be their barrier to getting it. Biden also clashed over immigration with former Obama cabinet secretary Julian Castro. Castro wants to decriminalize migrant border crossings. If you cross the border illegally, you should be able to be sent back. It's a crime. First of all, Mr. Vice President, it looks like one of us has learned the lessons of the past and one of us hasn't. New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand challenged Biden about some long ago comments he made about women in the workplace. Most women have to work to provide for their kids. Many women want to be working to provide for their communities Thank you, and to Senator. help people. Let so the Vice either you don't up. believe Thank it you. today or what did you mean when you said it then? I was deeply involved in making sure there's the equal pay amendments. I was deeply involved in all these things. I came up with the It's On Us proposal to see to it that women were treated more decently on college campuses. You came to Syracuse University with me and said it was wonderful. I'm passionate about the concern making sure women are treated equally. I don't know what's happened except that you're now running for president. But when they were not attacking each other, the Democrats were eager to turn their fire on President Trump, including Colorado Senator Michael Bennett. We've been consumed by a president who frankly doesn't give a damn about your kids or mine. Mr. President, kids belong in classrooms, not cages. Biden also went after Trump on some of his recent controversial comments on race and diversity. So Mr. President, let's get something straight. We love it. We are not leaving it. We are here to stay, and we're certainly not going to leave it to you. Democrats debate next in September, and there could be fewer contenders on stage because of tighter qualifying rules. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Meanwhile, a week-long war of words continues between President Donald Trump and a powerful Democratic lawmaker investigating the Trump White House, Congressman Elijah Cummings of Maryland. The president is criticizing Cummings' Baltimore district as a rat and rodent-infested mess, comments that many have denounced as racist. Baltimore once thrived as an industrial city, but today, like many of America's urban centers, it's struggling to deal with racial unrest, crime, economic inequality, and high unemployment. VOA's Carolyn Prosciutti has the story. Four years ago, rioters in Baltimore, Maryland, torched and looted several pharmacies after a black suspect died in police custody. Both stores are within the district of U.S. Representative Elijah Cummings. Today, the stores are rebuilt, but an undercurrent of tension remains. Those people are living in hell in Baltimore. President Trump tweeted that Cummings District was a rat and rodent infested mess where no one would want to live. Some slammed the comments as an unwarranted jab at a majority African American city. Others see a grain of truth. The killings, like you said, the rats and everything. We just need a whole bar. We just need a whole makeover. This is an entire block of vacant houses, some of the nearly 17,000 in Baltimore. But some say the squabble isn't about city blight. It was political retribution. Kim Trueheart runs a youth nonprofit project in Cummings District. She says the president is angry with Cummings because his House Oversight Committee is investigating the administration, including Trump's business dealings. The congressman has also sharply criticized conditions for detained migrants at the border. What does that mean when a child is sitting in their own feces? While many see the Trump coming spat as political jousting with racial overtones, some hope the focus on Baltimore will bring change. I feel that instead of downing a city, put, put collective heads together and let's make it better. Trueheart says Baltimore's teens need jobs. She points to the so-called squeegee kids who offered a clean car windshields for donations. I love the fact that they're not sitting back. 
They're not trying to steal it. They're out working. The challenge is let's give them legitimate work. While Trump has focused his fury on Baltimore's inner city, Cummings District also extends into prosperous suburbs. These leafy, safe streets of single-family homes are about 20 kilometers from downtown Baltimore. Like many urban areas, Baltimore is a tale of two cities, one of which cries out for help. In Baltimore, Maryland, Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. The United States and China have wrapped up another round of trade talks with both sides calling the meeting in Shanghai frank and constructive. But the two sides also expressed discontent with each other's tactics. Zlatita Hok reports. Wednesday's talk in China's biggest city and global financial hub Shanghai ended without a deal, but negotiators cited progress and agreed to meet again in September. The United States has accused China of dragging its feet in the hope of getting a more favorable agreement. Even before the meeting, U.S. President Donald Trump warned Beijing that he might impose tougher trade terms on China if the talks are not concluded before the 2020 U.S. presidential election. They would just love if I got defeated. China's foreign ministry said Wednesday that Beijing would not succumb to pressure. It's pointless to tell others to take medication when you're the one who is sick. On the issue of trade negotiations, we think the United States should show more sincerity and good faith. The two sides met face to face for the first time since they failed to reach an agreement at a meeting in Washington more than two months ago. The U.S. team, led by Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, negotiated for China's commitment to purchase American agricultural goods. China wants the U.S. to reduce tariffs on Chinese imports in the United States. A key economist at the multinational investment bank Berenberg does not expect a speedy agreement. The Chinese economy is more dependent on sales in the United States and on contact with the technology leader U.S. with Silicon Valley than the other way around. But the Chinese political system is more patient compared to the American system. Both sides probably think they have better cards in their hands, and that's why it's so hard to come to an agreement. But the Hamburg-based economist also warns that a prolonged dispute could undermine the global economy. The uncertainty that this dispute causes about the future trade regime affects not only China and the U.S., but in principle the industry in almost the entire world. And that is actually a major reason why the industry in Germany is weakening considerably. The U.S.-China trade dispute has dragged for more than a year with the world's two largest economies imposing billions of dollars in tariffs on each other's imports, affecting global supply chains and financial markets. Zlarica Hoek, VO News, Washington. And that's our show. Have a good night.